very much indeed, Jean. Okay, I think the technicalities are sorted. Jacques and the Red Wheelbarrow team, thank you very much indeed for featuring Bernard Levinson's fine poetry for the occasion tonight. I'm uh, privileged uh, to, to be the reader of this fine collection. Um, I'm honoring a friendship uh, that was formed between me and Bernard uh, only in the last five years of his life through a mutual and dear friend of ours, Effie Joffe, who took delight in sharing friends and bring them together. And, and Bernard and I established a very quick and deep rapport, and he shared an enthusiasm for the poet Norman Morrissey, uh, which I had published through Echoing Green, and that reinforced and, and widened and deepened our friendship. I'd also like to say briefly that it's, it's an extraordinary lucky thing that the COVID has brought us and that the Red Wheelbarrow and Off the Wall are Zoom events, which now make poetry reading a national possibility instead of small local uh, real life gatherings uh, so that the poets of the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape and the Transvaal and Natal can all tune in and indeed an international audience. I'm going to read from the collected poems of Bernard Levinson, which was published in 2020 and brings together uh, five uh, collections of his, beginning with his uh, best-selling poetry collection, From Breakfast to Madness, published in 1974 by Raven Press. And, uh, you can see how, from the very beginning, this established Bernard Levinson as, as an important figure in the South African scene of poetry. He, he struck a pure voice from the beginning. I'm going to read then to start with, and most of the time I'm just going to let the poems speak for themselves, though I will make some comments uh, at certain points. So here's the first one. Your small fist. There's no need for words. Your small fist cupped in the palm of my hand. I insinuate a finger inside the curled barricade and reach the temperature, the amount of hurt, the whole tight pain of your young life. I remember once before my first call to the township between the steaming huts on the lip of a makeshift road where I swung my black bag brush as a boy, safe in his medical school. The dark girl <clears throat> in labor was younger than I, a child bearing a child. I fumbled in my bag looking for words among the shoehorn shoe horn shapes, the trumpets and the string. In the end she cried and I held her hand. The file. The file said eight years old and gave a list of all the homes she'd lived in, orphanages, places of safety, homes for little girls who have no home. The reports were formal, factual. Nowhere could I find the little girl. She was serious. She held a doll upside down and waited. Please, sir, do you mind if I love you? Schizophrenia 4. I watch you walking in your dream walk, up and down the empty square, past the one bare tree the hard music of the loudspeakers falling about you. Your step is unsteady. An old sailor pacing the memory of a flat deck in the roll and pitch of a chronic ward. I remember you this way, always walking and alone. I would put you to sleep 
seeing the sitting the lightning loose in your brain and always after i would find you walking alone it was august when they brought you to my room how are you i asked you lifted your eyebrows and your mouth began the search for words how long did we stand there you and i waiting while you walked your secret desert looking for words smoke you said just like that in congress and final your eyebrows pumping your mouth shaping and reshaping the other words that never came outside the tree in your square world had just turned green You tell me she was crying when you phoned her. Crying, that's all I remember. In spite of the jokes and funny stories, I only remember the crying. My mother cried for all the children in the neighborhood. She cried for Jews all over the world. She also cried for me. Once in a dream, a burst of birds left my chest i knew the birds were tears once in a dream a fisherman dragged his net i knew the struggle was mine and i knew the nets would be filled with her crying mother i am standing at your side it is friday night the candles are lit you are blessing our home with tears there's no room inside me to store this weeping mahalisberg the smell of rain washed brass spins me back to the mountains a rough cliff in the tall rocks a grass clearing and water a low pitched tent and the water the sweet taste of the warm wet breath of summer morning how odd that in all the fragrance of my garden a splinter of scent the merest edge in the evening air can hold me rooted to yesterday remembering that bernard uh, spent years of his early uh, youth uh, in america with his family this poem is america america i remember the brainwashed mornings of my childhood standing before the upright piano pledging allegiance to a barber pole flag my eyes always on the day's milk stacked under the blackboard 30 years later with snow falling on the milk white memory sorry on the milk white morning of my memory i take off the socks i wear as gloves my country tis of thee i set my odd shoe foot behind the leg of the desk of thee i sing watching the day's milk i can never afford land where my father was always an old man carrying the depression home in his empty hands america i am surprised how these old wounds bleed <clears throat> on viewing his paintings for taffy whitman i'm afraid to walk in your pictures there's not a scene i don't know or have not known all my life i'm not fooled by the draining of color that i might believe this is only a dream i recognize shadows when only in the light is shown i'm afraid to walk in your pictures 
your loneliness is too much like my own. Numbers of Levinson's poems relate to painters and painting um, as the most familiar art other than poetry with which he loves to live. The last one from then this first collection is to Simon. I remember once you were in the backyard wearing my pajamas. For one bizarre moment, I thought you were me. And it was I standing in the darkness, coming out of the servant's room, hearing a noise and walking to the window. It was I who looked in at the white face. Is everything all right, boss? Yes, I said, everything is all right now. <clears throat> the next collection is called Welcome to the Circus. It was published in 1991. And we begin with a poem titled, The Fish Are Asleep. The fish are asleep, undressed, they are stones fragmenting the green darkness. The moon sings them to sleep in a shower of silver shards. My father floats into my dream. We are fish in a glass bowl. He drifts, stirring shadows with empty hands. I shout words of love a kaleidoscope of silent bubbles. Your tongue swims inside my mouth like a small fish. It plays hide and seek with all my words. I am lulled into silence. For Sheila, number one, I love you, moon moon breast, sleep warm, innocent in the dark palm cradle, moon thigh, silk smooth flowing, and always the secret moon forest. Gently, I enter the calm circle, the blue green fire, the orange wheel burning, torn purple, round yellow, rising, in the endless night. Your last painting. Your last painting is a portrait of me, a Turneresque sky burning to mist, a burnished sea, sweeping plains of silence. It's me in my 60th year the conflict of passion and stillness, the struggle for grace. What a remarkable poetic response to a portrait painted, a painted portrait, and what makes great portrait painters, the penetration into the, the very character of the subject. The next one, the passage of birds. The birds lift and wheel, shaping the warm currents that lift off the sea. Remember how we watched them rise and gather, leaving the evening sky and Israel for their journey south. Remember holding hands in Dysengorf Street, buying an ancient ring to bind the days and the nights and the passage of birds in a ring shape with no beginning and without an end. When I was a kite, when I was a kite lifting above the red cloud of my mother's womb, I knew the ache, the sweet longing, the cords tug in my stillness. I want to stand before you naked. 
I want to trace again that secret path, this love that flows from your breasts to my lips, from your sun to that shade where only my heart casts a shadow. When ancient anatomists, when ancient anatomists opened the heart for the first time, God was asleep in the parachute cords of the small valves. A finding of some moment and much bewilderment, not in a church or a temple, but here, between the soul's breath, God lived in the ebb and flow of the blood's tide. I'm reminded of Lawrence's concept of blood consciousness. For Sheila, too, your breasts still cast their gentle shadows in my dreams, holding you while you sleep. I hear your heart beat in the core of my chest. The night sings to me. The stars undress. They sleep in the soft folds of your thighs. I am still in awe. In this haphazard world of desperate aloneness, in the uncontrollable chaos of living, I found you. The next collection, titled I See You, was published in 2001. I'm going to read the first short poem, which gives its title to the collection, I See You. I see you, she said, wiping apart hate from her eyes, standing tall, her small breasts reflecting the gentle sweep of her lower spine. I see you too, I say. I see you for the first time. We reach out and touch, tentative, uncertain. I'm happy, I can say. Sit corner. I'm here. At this point, I'd, I'd just like to pause for a moment uh, and to introduce a perspective from D.H. Lawrence that I think is congenial and insightful to Levinson's poetic engagement with sexuality in the woman-man relationship. Lawrence wrote in the introduction to one of his psychology books, commenting on Genesis and the Eden story and the psychology of it in relevance to human understanding. Adam and Eve fell not because they had sex, or even because they committed the sexual act, but because they became aware of their sex and the possibility of the act. When sex became to them a mental object, that is when they discovered that they could deliberately enter upon and enjoy and even provoke sexual activity in themselves, then they were cursed and cast out of Eden. However, there is a corollary, he says, when Adam and Eve became aware of sex in themselves, they also became aware of that which was pristine in them and which preceded knowing. Elsewhere, Lawrence approved of St. Augustine's belief that God's cre God creates the world anew each day. The upshot of this is that we may, in Lawrence's sense, be on each side of Eden on any given day. This perspective, I think, helps us see how Levinson, in his erotic love poems, innocently ventured deep into the erotic heartlands of aroused desire and across the orgasmic threshold. This is the only long poem of Levinson's I'm going to read, which runs over three or four pages in eight parts. Homage to Women, part one. The dream begins in the darkest breach of my sleeping soul, a curtain opens and she is there, naked as water. 
She is all breast, all mother, and with an ache I know she is all woman. Part two. She unwound the snake from her wrist. He abandoned the memories of Eden, the fruits and the flaming sword. The soul of the earth mother was there in her eyes. They were unashamed of her milk white breasts, the roundness and the softness of her hips. She lifted herself above his head in balance. Part three. Her walk was languid, heavy breasts and ample thighs, voluptuous, naked, smelling of earth and rain. I drown in the whirlpool of shoulders and arms. Part four. She was dancing alone in Zayem Bekiko, a dance for men, for older men who know the despair of being men the passion and the defeat. She held her head high like all Greek men. She made no attempt to hide her sex. She thrust her breasts proudly, filling the small room with the smell of musk and blood. She sank to one knee as men do. She rose slowly, breathing darkness and sweat. It was a dance for men, the rhythm and the pain was all woman. Part five. She thrust her tired breasts as she walked, her bottom remembering an arrogance, each step lifting a roundness. She is still afraid of that dark orchid flowering between her thighs. Aphrodite forever ashamed of the sensuous dream. Part six, sensual like a Georgia O'Keeffe flower, the red invites me. I write poems on your thighs while you sleep, wild red poems filled with turmoil and love, with dark clouds twisting in a restless sky, with cloud lakes pouring steam and foam, and a Georgia O'Keeffe flower singing I write poems on your forehead while you paint. Part seven. The heavens undressed, the naked stars whisper her name, goddess of night. She alone can touch the secret hurt in the aching heart. Weaving her crown of shadows, she commands the soul, the shrieking blood the ancient crumbling bone. At her command, the lemon moon turns the sea into silver, the trees and the sand into stone. Part eight. She stretches like a cat, unwinding the tightness, freeing the ebb and rush of blood. Her muscles breathe the morning light. When she stretches, she is the willow arching in the gentle wind. She is the ocean's slap and flood when the tide wakes. When she stretches, the shadows disappear. The sun sings on her brown skin. A lovely long poem in eight parts. Homage to women. All night, all night the seagulls cried outside my window. The echo of your body, the secret imprint of your breasts, dreams heavy with ocean and mist, the morning weeps. My love, my love, the waves have taken our footprints. We are remembered. The wind etches our names on small stones. Asleep, your skin tastes of the sea. We have learned to lock our bodies. The same ocean lifts and falls 
in our dreams. Is it your breast's heat? Is it your breast's heat that draws my hand in the cold bed? Does it know a nipple will wake stretching itself, trembling into a wild conflagration? What secret mysteries the fingers know? For Hilda, storm against the darkness, rage with every nerve in your soul, Hilda, resist the shadow's drag. Deepening night will drown your labored breath. Hilda, the cold wind has found your heart, burst red, blood red, crying in the empty room, shriek red, then the awful stillness. Gently, Hilda, gently, let the silence surround you. For Jean, for a sculpting in her memory, majestic and serene, the wood floats on its ebony stand. Now it is male, with echoes of power and musk bursting on the gold skin grain. Now it is a woman, a sweep of thigh, a proud arching of the neck. There is always pain, the shrinking of life and bone. Jean, the wind sings, the wild olive tree sings, the tryst and core of this wood soul sings. You will be remembered. For Rachel. Rachel lives in a cocoon. She is obsessed with the endless tangle of silken threads. When will she discover she is a butterfly? The fourth collection is titled, I Dream I Was Flying, published in 2007. Sandpipers. The gentle yin seeps its frosty, frothy edge into the sand and wells back into the immense core of the sea. The angry Yang slaps the beach and races to the furthest rim. Sandpipers know the unstoppable rhythm. With a blurring of frenetic matchstick legs, they chase the melting yin and desperately flee the surging Yang. We are all sandpipers in this ebb and flow of living. Dialogue with Sheila's painting. Is it silent? It is always silent in the beginning. Will there be mist? The earth is cradled in mist at the moment of birth. The sun comes later, discovering its heat as it lifts. Are there people? This is the silence before their our eyes. This is the way the earth begins. A poem about fire. Write a poem about fire, she said. An African fire, darkness and sea. I stand before this small canvas. The oils crackle and burn. The heat scorches my face. A rage pent up smoldering erupts. The flames curl, searing my brain and all my life. A remarkable poem conceived as a painting.
climbing the Drakensberg, celebrating the miracle of shadows, the ever-changing web etched on the white rock face, walking with the sun, tent pegged on a shelf, a busy rumbling stream, and the Drakensberg breathing, celebrating the horizon shift. Not the sea, not the healing bush, not forests heavy with scented bark, but here on the world's roof, hearing the silence of the soul. We came to a cleft of rock, God's window in a mountain cathedral. I heard the sun bursting fire in an African sky, the roar of light on the horizon edge, the burning valley shouting a dark green in a shimmer of heat. The sound filled my eyes. Your, you heard it in your soul. Pardon me, I spoiled those last two lines. The sounds filled my eyes. You heard it in your soul. A single rose, a single rose sits on my desk listening. She's clearly embarrassed. Talking about love makes her blush. A deep arterial glow spreading dark magenta at her core. Secretly, I'm envious. I can't remember such innocence and it's far too late to pretend. For Benjamin, born in May 2001. Benjamin asleep on his father's chest, a fragile transition bathed in the sounds of his mother's breast. He listens at last to the rhythm of men. Benjamin, in all your dreams, your soul will return again and again to the comfort of a woman's heart. And finally, we come to the last collection published only in 2020, less than a year uh, before his death. And with these last poems in mind, uh, I think uh, how wonderfully these lines from Yeats' Sailing to Byzantium uh, are emblematic of Bernard Levinson's vital spirit and, and ebullience in his final years. A week before he died, he phoned me with great enthusiasm, encouraging me and wishing me luck uh, for the launch of Norman Morrissey's recent book, Gripscapes. That was how vital he was towards the end, full of enthusiasm. These lines from Sailing to Byzantium. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. When I see your face, when I see your face, even now in the late harvest of this mysterious life, my heart remembers the hop, skip and jump of all our meetings. When you took off your clothes to lie at my side, every cell and fiber of my being still holds its breath. Saturday, 25th of April, 2020. We are making love. We are laughing. We burst into each day with joy and a magical intensity. Lying in bed, I suddenly discover I can feel the lower edge of my liver in my abdomen. I can feel a hard mass. 
I am suddenly reminded, hey, you're supposed to be dying. The room gets darker and colder. Listen. Listen to the heartbeat of the drum. The great Nguni cattle are whispering. We have stretched their souls over the face of the moon. The moon is singing songs of darkness, ancient rhythms, stories from the beginning of time. Such a question. And God said, Adam knew Eve, one cryptic apocalyptic word, a sanction for loving, to lose oneself in a glorious moment of ecstasy. Would the world have changed if God had said, now Adam understands Eve? One can't help but delight in his humor. Bochum's by wedding. Only love can shelter us from life. 10,000 angels will be there. They never miss a fairy tale wedding. They will be everywhere in Liz's eyes and the tips of Hank's fingers. They bring the blessings of love. Only love can shelter us from life. Velvet words. Velvet words describe the magic journey my fingers take discovering your breasts. The nipples wake to butterfly touch. The silk flow of your back to that dark cleft, the feather forest. Asleep at my side, I melt into your dreams. Lightness. Children understand Tai Chi. The capacity to float is built in. They have butterflies in their fingertips. We have to reclaim a lightness, seek out the tired butterflies hidden in our souls. Bernard practiced Tai Chi all of his life, right up to the last week of his life. Tai Chi was an important discipline and, and practice for freedom. Well, that uh, is the collection of poems that I've read. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this book, for anybody who is a serious lover of poetry in South Africa, you must have this book, you must get it. Uh, it's available, I believe, from Majaji Books, exclusive books, and uh, elsewhere. Um, um, it's, it's collected poems. It's very, that's right. Very good. That's right. Collected yeah. poems, Bernard Levinson, published by Hands On Press, Hands On Books, uh, in 2020. If there are any questions, I might be able to answer them, um, but I really uh, um, help mm. and emphasize the importance of... Yeah, I'll choose one quickly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, before, I, I, I think before, before, say, before we take questions, I just, I just want to say um, a quick word of thanks for such a generous reading from such a obviously generous poet. Can we can we just put our hands together and and yeah? Can we just give a hand to the gentleman? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's clearly an astonishing an astonishing body of work. Um, so I think there was a, I think there was a question. I'd like to add a word of thanks. Thank you so much, Jim. 
you, you did Bernard proud. It was really, really nice to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, Gwen, please go ahead. Jeff yes. um, was the guy who made the statement. Um, Jim. Jeffrey his name. Um, I'd like to thank you for your wonderful reading of Bernard's poetry. He would have been absolutely thrilled, and I'm sure he was listening and smiling and crying and probably rushing to find a pen. <laughs> thank you very, very much indeed. Um, you've, you've really touched me with your reading and your selection, which I loved. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen, very much indeed. Uh, let me say that one of the most remarkable, uh, sensitive and insightful in views, reviews of any poetry I've read uh, was one um, written by Gwen Padre uh, uh, for the launch of, of this book in 2020. Um, it, I have circulated it to Jacques and it might be possible for, for him to circulate it. It's a brilliant review. Uh, and Gwen really reaches into the heart uh, and of, of Bernard Levinson's achievement. And I'm so glad to report too that um, she's going to follow on with Bernard's uh, enthusiasm for Norman Morrissey and, and she will be uh, writing a review of Gripscapes. But Gwen, thank you for your kind words. I hope Sheila was able to listen as well. I, I haven't been able to see who's, who's in the room. Sadly, she was not. She was unable to connect to the link which I sent to her, but I see that you're recording, and I wonder if it might be possible to get a recording to her at some stage, somehow. Yes, I'm, I'm glad to say, Gwen, that it has been recorded, and Jacques will make uh, it available um, in a link uh, in due course, and I'll make certain to get it to you, and, and I hope that you can then share it with Sheila. Absolutely. I I hope very much that she can can hear it. I, she was very much in my thoughts as well. Yes, yes, she was very much present, even though she's not able to listen. Sure. Um, I will make. I will be absolutely sure to get a recording to her. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Gwen. Yeah, look, if there are any questions, uh, and Gwen is is in in the room, she might be able to answer them. If I can't, but um, yes, uh, I think that. Bernard Levinson is, is a foremost poet in South Africa. Uh, and, and like any great poet, he transcends um, our pure locality. He's not purely a South African poet. He's a poet for the world at large. Uh, his humanity, his insight, uh, and his sensitivity to the human story um, uh, is, is of an international order. Thank you so much, Jim, for that insight. Jacques, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. So I I was very very moved by by what you read, Jim, and I'm fascinated by the link between uh, passion and silence, and it's a link that Bernard makes in the Sandpiper poem. Yes, and I'm struck by some of the mentally ill people speak. Uh, in the poem, one or two of them in the, speak in the poems that you that you read, and even though they are hard to reach, and I'm 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 haunted by the silence of, and I, and I think, you know, I, I'm it's you know it's intentional. There's something heroic about it, but I'm haunted by the silence of the women in the erotic poems, and I'm thinking about, especially the, the homage to women poem mm -hmm. um, and the dancer that she does not, that she does not speak. Um, to, and the, to me, I, the poem to me seems to contain a sadness that something, something about the despair of men seems to have to do that the women, you know, that they can't, hear, maybe they can't hear what the women are saying. I don't know if you want to, if, if, if that rings any bells for you, if there's something you'd like to say about it. Well, yes, I think that that's a, 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 a very important point. 
there is an aspect of, of the whole modern sexual revolution where men had to discover that women loved sex as well. That somehow in the mind of patriarchal society, women were imagined as, as there to serve men and to serve their erotic needs. But that the women are silent doesn't, to me, imply that there's passivity there. There's a strong sense of, of engagement on the part of the women. Yes. Um, and I also think that there's also, <laughs> there are so many dimensions and nuances to his looking at the man-woman relationship. In that poem um, where, uh, where Adam, uh, the question is, had Adam been told and God and man, uh, Adam understood Eve rather than knew her. In other words, the eternal mystery of not really uh, understanding uh, for a man to understand a woman. And there is there's a mysterious divide, but it is in the carnal congress, which he so vividly pictures, that there is that conjunction. Um, mm. as he uses that image, we locked ourselves together. Uh, uh, at one point. So there is a strong sense of the combined and shared um, uh, eroticism that brings men and women together. Mm. I, I don't know if that's much of an answer, but something. Yes. yes. Thank you for the uh, very thoughtful question there, Jacques. Thank you so much, Jacques. Are there any other questions or comments? before we take a break. Any questions, any comments? Okay, there's another comment from Gwen. Please go ahead, Gwen. Just want to make one comment. I, I, I entered this room a little late. So Jim, I don't know what, what selection you made from the early part of From Breakfast to Madness, but uh -huh. Bernard, but Bernard, um, many years ago, formed a strong friendship with a poet, Anne Sexton, yes. and they corresponded for a long time. They, mm. they, they formed a, an almost preternatural bond, um, mm. and it had a huge impact on his work, and I think possibly on her writing. Mm. So I just, that thought came up when Jacques was talking about the mental patients. So thanks. Yeah. Yes. I'll send you. I'll send you uh, the list of poems that I, I read uh, by email, Gwen. Thank you very much. Anyway, thank you uh, again, everybody, uh, and especially Jacques and the Red Wheelbarrow team for making this wonderful opportunity for Bernard Levinson's poetry. Um, I hope this helps spread and widen and deepen his recognition. And again, I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to honor our friendship and to honor the man and to honor his poetry, which will outlive us all. Thank you again very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Uh, there's also a comment from Sue who says, thank you, that was wonderful. And with that, we're gonna take a five minute break. So we will be back at 2027 uh, for our open mic session. Want 